my name is Sister Mary Juanita, and it has been a blessing to enter the role of Director of Faith Formation for the Diocese. I have been under her guidance to prepare for this day and for taking on the role, and I'm very grateful for that. Her kindness, wisdom, and Christ-centered service has touched many hearts, so thank you, Sister. As well, we are very blessed to have a wonderful team of Curia members and support staff who many of you will see today helping around. And I look forward to working along with them to supporting you uh, in the education and developing faith formation. So I would like to now introduce to you our keynote speaker, His Excellency Bishop Quinn. It has been a privilege to have His Excellency lead us into the year of faith with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Since his ordination to the priesthood, Bishop Quinn has served the church in various roles of teaching, including secondary school as diocesan director of education, seminary professor, and university professor. In 2009, Bishop Quinn was named the bishop for the Diocese of Venona. We are grateful at the diocese for his attention to the formation of minds in the truth. At present, a role close to his heart is teaching students at St. Mary's University a course on the creed, which is the foundation of our faith. As we begin this year of faith, we are honored to have Bishop Quinn present the keynote address on the creed. Thank you. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here today, not only to have celebrated the Eucharist with you, but now to have for about 50 minutes to walk through the uh, presentation on the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. So I'd like to share with you what's dear in my heart. I get to teach this course a whole semester of it. In fact, yesterday, my students are probably not talking to me now, they had their midterm yesterday. So I'm sure they all did well, but I won't have a chance to correct those exams immediately. But what's so good is to see another generation of our faithful who are learning about the faith. A uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, Monsignor Coletti and I went up to Minneapolis, St. Paul, to attend the Catholic Medical Association and we went up on a Friday evening kind of late because I had the Mass on Saturday morning. So as we get up there, the computers are all down in the hotel. And so they said to Monsignor and to me, uh, we have to do this all by hand. So you had to fill out all the forms. And then also they had to go through, you know, stacks to be sure that they had the right rooms and that they were clean and that when you received that, that the room was available. So Monsignor got his, and we all said, we'll see at 7 in the morning. And then I went up to mine, put it in the, with the key, and it turned, the little light went green. I went in, and as I got in, the door shut, and then I noticed two pieces of luggage open. And as I'm standing there trying to take this all in, I hear a voice coming out of the restroom, that says, it's a man's voice, honey, I'll be right out. <laughs> I knew I would be a huge disappointment <laughs> to him. And I was also uh, concerned, do I just run out of the room? And then he's going to think I'm a thief and then come out and tackle me and then find out the, you know, it's a priest, and then the bishop, you know. So then I thought, well, i got to say something. So I said, I'm really sorry. I said, uh, they, as you know, the computers are all down. And I said, uh, it worked, and I came in. I said, I'm really on my way out. And he said to me, that's okay. Good to talk to you. <laughs> so... I hope you will find this good to talk today as we look at the Creed of Nicaea.
but also that this is a time for us to kind of deepen again our, our faith and that what we learn today we can take with us because every Sunday this is the creed that we recite. Our Holy Father asks that we catechize through this year on the creed and to use it as a basis for our catechesis throughout the year. We want to work, as we know, as I mentioned in the homily, the documents of Vatican II, but also we want to look at the catechism of the Catholic faith, and in particular, the teachings of the creed. Now, I hope this will all work. The computer does. Look at this. Wow, as if by magic. I'd like you to take a look at, this is from Porta Fidei, the door of faith. This is from our Holy Father. Notice the word indiction of the year of the faith. When I first saw this, I thought my secretary had mistyped it. And she pointed out to me, oh no, Bishop, that's exactly what it is. Take a look at the text you gave me. And I said, good, I guess my eyes didn't see it. Indiction means to be able to pronounce. It means to go ahead and make uh, a decision about. So when we say indiction, what it means is that the Holy Father is making this year a special year and he's pronouncing that. He's proclaiming it. He's making it known. And then you notice this wonderful introduction. The door of faith. And that comes right from the scriptures. Is always open to us ushering us into the life of communion with God and offering entry into his church. Uh, the year of faith is so that you and I not only deepen our life in God, but in the church. You see, what's unique about our Roman Catholic faith is you can't have Jesus without the church. If you're going to be a person of faith and you love the Lord, and I know we all do, but we have to love the sacrament of his presence, which is the church. So our Holy Father says that this year is about not only entering into a deeper life of communion, a deeper life of friendship and intimacy, but also entering into his church. Let's read this next one together. It is possible to cross that threshold when the word of God is proclaimed and the heart allows itself to be shaped by transforming grace. Now you notice God takes the initiative. The word is always God's initiative to us, but then transforming grace. Then God's life, our will, now has to be touched by grace so that faith becomes living and beautiful and expressed. So that when our Holy Father says that the heart allows itself, you see there's our freedom. And I'm sure we all know, freedom is our ecstasy, it's our agony. It's both the greatest joy we have, but we also know freedom can be a great burden. How to go ahead and conform our freedom to God. I'm sure every day we know the choices. And we know the difficulty. And we struggle. But we also know that God's transforming grace is always available so that the human heart can be shaped. It's, now read, let's read the next one. To enter through that door is to set out on a journey that lasts a lifetime. Isn't that beautiful? Once you enter into Christ, once you enter into the journey, once you allow grace to start transforming your life, it's a lifetime. It goes on, not just for a period, it's all the way to our last breath. Then our Holy Father says, it begins with baptism through which we can address God as Father. It ends with the passage through death to eternal life. The fruit of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, whose will it was by the gift of the Holy Spirit 
to draw those who believe in him into his own glory. Notice how that's really what we call the economy of salvation. What's the ordering? How does it happen? God is not just this distant God. We call him Father. We have an intimate expression of love. You know, and when my father was alive, I was the only one, and my brother and sister could call him Dad. Other people coming over to the house, my friends, they never use that. That's a term of intimacy. When you speak of the person as father. Well, that's what happens when we enter through the doorway of faith. We address God as Father. And it ends in the passage from death to eternal life. And how did that come about? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection is the keystone. It is what changes us from just being religious people into being Christians. To believe that of all the people in human history, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead because he is fully human and fully divine. That what happened in him is now going to happen one day in each of us. And then it says, to profess faith in the Trinity. Our Holy Father always draws us back into that communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That communio that brings us as sisters and brothers is to believe in the one God who is love. The Father who is the fullness in the fullness of time sent his Son for our salvation. Jesus Christ who is the mystery and of his death and resurrection redeemed the world. And the Holy Spirit who leads the church across the centuries as we await the Lord's glorious return. The Holy Father really sums it all up. All of salvation history, all of God's saving works in that paragraph. And that he says we await his glorious return. He hasn't just abandoned us. He's with us now and he's coming back one day in glory. And the beauty of that, the Holy Spirit holds this church through the centuries. Now, if you've ever had a chance to look at any church history, isn't it amazing we're all still here? I mean, you look at efforts to go ahead and destroy the church, both within and without. Times when we even, the papacy, we had, what, three popes at one time, all claiming. We had the Protestant Reformation, the fracturing of Christianity. And yet through all of those things, the Lord's Holy Spirit has held us in union and kept us in communio. I've always felt in my own life one of the proofs of the apostolic faith is the fact that for 2,000 years we're all still believing in the same Christ. We still believe in the resurrection. We hold the Eucharist as the food for our journey, the body and blood of the Lord. And we profess this creed that unites us in every culture. I'd like you to take a look at this beautiful uh, painting that's done by Caravaggio. This is one of my favorites, St. Thomas and the Risen Christ. Now just study it for a minute. Let it kind of work into your heart. Let's see the text based on this wonderful masterpiece by Caravaggio. How about if we read it together? The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of John. Together now, it happened that one of the twelve, Thomas, the name means twin, was absent when Jesus came. The other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. His answer was, I will never believe it without probing the nail prints in his hand without putting my finger in the nail marks and my hand into his side. A week later, the disciples were once more in the room, and this time Thomas was with them. Despite the locked doors, Jesus came and stood before them. Peace be with you, he said. Then to Thomas, take your finger and examine my hand. 
put your hand into my side. Do not persist in your unbelief, but believe. Thomas said in response, My Lord and my God. Jesus then said to him, You became a believer because you saw me. Blessed are they who have not seen and have believed. Jesus performed many other signs as well, signs not recorded here in the presence of his disciples, but these have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, so that through this faith you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Doesn't that describe, isn't that captured in that painting? Take a look at the expression on St. Thomas. Can you see his face? The first week he wasn't there. I always wondered why he wasn't there. You ever get tired sometimes of the faculty you serve with? You ever sometimes get tired at a family gathering? Or sometimes you've got to be by yourself? Maybe you just got to take something in. Maybe you're not quite sure what everybody's telling you. I don't know. Scriptures are silent. It allows us to ponder it in prayer about some times when we're absent ourselves, when we don't want to be present. But notice, can you see to the far left of this painting where Jesus has opened his garment. Can you see the wound in Jesus? And can you see that hand that's sort of in the middle of the painting? That's Jesus' hand. And what is he doing? He has grasped St. Thomas's hand by the wrist, right below the hand. And he is leading St. Thomas's hand right to the womb, where he is saying to him, I want you now to be a believer. Now notice the beauty of that passage and the way it's captured. You know, Thomas has, if it's unfortunate, the, I wish the painting was a little lighter, but his look on his eyes, it's that moment of surprise. Like, he's really here. Like, he's here. This is real. What I said and what I asked for is happening. And then Jesus, of course, receives his affirmation and says, my Lord and my God. But then Jesus speaks to all of us and said, blessed are you who have never seen and have believed. So for us, the ongoing life of faith, we're able to say, my Lord and my God, as Thomas. But the Lord loves us even more because we haven't touched that risen body. He hasn't taken your hand and mine to put into his side or into his nail marks. Now, I think our Holy Father is asking us through this year of faith to reconnect because our faith is what discloses our relationship with Jesus, with the Father in heaven, and the outpouring of the Spirit. And our faith is challenged in the world today. Is this real? Or is the resurrection something made up? Is it a group of disciples who were hysterical? Or did Jesus really come through locked doors, stand in their midst, and say, peace be with you? What I love also is when uh, in the passage that we have with this, when Jesus comes, he doesn't say to them, what a disappointment all of you are. Now, I'd be tempted to do that, wouldn't you? If ever you've been a teacher, you leave the classroom and come back in, and they're all yelling and having a good time, what's the first thing you say? What a disappointment. I've been at this with you for a whole six months, and you're still acting as if we had never been together. Well, Jesus does not come. That's not divine love. Instead, he says, peace be with you. Now, Jesus in this gospel encourages faith, and especially for each one of us. 
Now, the focus of my uh, uh, work this morning is going to be on the Nicene Creed. So creeds are statements of belief. That's what they are. Statements of belief. I often get the question from my students, they think of creeds as happening in the third century. And I always say to them, no, creeds are right in the scriptures. And here's one. A creed is a statement of belief. Now this is one of my favorites. It's from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, 4 to 9. The Hebrew word shema means hear. Like listen. Listen, O Israel. Like, come on now. Don't look down and pull out a hymnal. Listen. Don't start putting a list together. Listen. Let's read this together. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. Therefore you shall love the Lord our God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Take to heart these words which I enjoin on you today. Drill them into your children. Speak of them at home and abroad, whether you are busy or at rest. Bind them at your wrists as a sign, and let them be as a pendant on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. This is a statement of belief about loving God with your whole heart, your whole soul, with all your strength. Notice what it says, drill it into your children. Did you ever have when you were a kid when your parents would say, get this in your head? Of course, I never did. So they'd have to say, get it again in your head. In other words, to understand this is the core of our beliefs about God's love for us. Those of you who have Jewish friends, and uh, I'm very blessed to have Jewish friends, and also there are some in our own family, one of the things that uh, you'll notice in there is it says, bind them at your wrists. You probably notice how Jewish people have this text, the law, on their arms. They are what? Saying, this has got to become part of me. So they wear it. The other thing is not only at the wrist, but as a pendant. Maybe you've seen where they have this box that is with straps around the head. They call this phylacteries. And that is, again, a way of not only getting us to be, to, for the, these teachings to be drilled into us, but also to get them into our head. And then you'll notice, write them on the doorposts in a Jewish home that will be in a little niche as you enter. And you would touch that as a way of expressing devotion. So we have one of the creeds. Here's another one. This is a little later in the book of Deuteronomy. And this is what we call neratio, where not just how God loves us, but what God has done for us. Let's read this together. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean who went down to Egypt with a small household and lived there as an alien. But there became a nation strong and numerous. When the Egyptians maltreated and oppressed us, imposing hard labor upon us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers. And he heard our cry and saw our affliction, our toil and our oppression. He brought us out of Egypt with his strong hand and outstretched arm, with terrifying power, with signs and wonders, and bringing us into this country, he gave us this land flowing with milk and honey. You notice how a creed narrates everything God has done? So in the Old Testament, they need to be reminded of what God has done for them. So you notice how Abraham, our father, is a wandering Aramean. Remember, Abraham was called, and he's the father now of a great nation. But you know, we forget pretty quickly. And so this is a creed to remind the Jewish people not only of their origins, but when they were being maltreated and were being oppressed, God was aware of them and so was aware of that affliction, 
brought them out of Egypt and gave us this land of flowing milk and honey. Creeds narrate God's wonderful gifts of salvation. They narrate what God has done for us. Now we'd like to look at a few of them in the New Testament because we're also, we're not yet to 325 to the Council of Nicaea. So we see their statements of belief in the old and also we want to see one of the earliest ones. If you can see that, that's St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians and he wrote two letters, first and second. Some scholars say there's probably maybe even four letters and some of the others survive as parts but we know for sure there's two. Now St. Paul loved this community and this was not an easy community to love. You remember this is the community of uh, in Corinth that's that isthmus there where uh, you have the, the straits that go through in Greece and one of the things about uh, the uh, uh, area there of Corinth, it was very cosmopolitan. If you would have loved New York and the busyness of it, you'd love Corinth. Now trying to establish a Christian community there was not easy. There was a lot of paganism, a lot of debauchery, and here St. Paul brings a church around Jesus Christ into existence. Now in this letter also, if you remember, there's factions and they're fighting. They're fighting each other. And St. Paul has to tell them, but we're the body of Christ. You can't be pulling it apart. He also gives the teaching on the resurrection. Now St. Paul, this is probably written around the year 56 AD. So if Jesus died in the year 33, this is one of the earliest writings in the New Testament. So St. Paul then wants everyone to know that he has seen the risen Christ. Let's read this together. Brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and in which you stand firm. You are being saved by it at this very moment if you hold fast to it as I preached it to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. I handed unto you, first of all, what I myself received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and in accordance with the Scriptures rose on the third day, that he was seen by Cephas and then by the Twelve. After that, he was seen by 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Next, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of the normal course. I am the least of the apostles. In fact, because I persecuted the church of God, I do not even deserve the name, but by God's favor, I am what I am. This favor of his to me is not proved fruitless. Indeed, I have worked harder than all the others, not on my own, but through the favor of God. In any case, whether it be I or there, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. The resurrection is the cornerstone. It transforms faith. Jesus Christ, who is risen. You notice how St. Paul, he's able to say to everyone, while I wasn't with the twelve. In fact, he says, I'm what, born out of the normal course? What he means by that is, I was selected specially. And he was on his way to Damascus to persecute. But what happens is, the risen Christ appears to him. Now you can even see how in the creed certain statements are already present. That he died for our sins. That in accordance with the scriptures he was buried. I rose on the third day. And then in case we wonder, 
Jesus was seen, it says, by more than 500 brothers at once, as well as by James and all the apostles. So in the uh, letter to the Corinthians, St. Paul is outlining for us what really is the beginnings of the creed, what it is we believe, and also the testimony. St. Paul in verse 3 there, he says, I handed on to you, and that is the Greek word paradosis, a living tradition, a living tradition that has been preached and handed on. So when St. Paul gives it, which he says he has given it to everyone, hold to it fast, and the way it preached, the way I preached it to you, otherwise what you have believed in vain. Now a couple of others. St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, probably around the year 58, maybe around 60. Any of you who have taken scripture courses, you know it's tough to date. They don't put dates at the bottom of things. So we usually have to do that internally with various criteria. But St. Paul writes this letter to the Philippians. Now, this also was a hymn. The early Christians sang this. Now, I don't know what the music, how it was sung, but when you see it even laid out in the epistle, you can see that this is differentiated. It's different from his letter. He's incorporated an early Christian hymn. And notice what he says, your attitude must be that of Christ. Though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself and took the form of a slave, being born of the likeness of men. Now, this shows a very early belief that Jesus as Son of God, that he is eternal. It says he was in the form of God. It's not that he became God. He is in the form of God. But he did not deem that equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he empties himself. Notice we call that in some ways divine condescension. That God would enter into our lives, the Son of God, and born of human likeness. It says he was known to be of human estate. It was thus he humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, death on a cross. Now notice the statements. These will become the framework of the creed. And then because of this God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name above every other name, so that at Jesus' name every knee must bend on the heavens, on the earth, under the earth, every tongue proclaim to the glory of God the Father, Jesus Christ is Lord. Now you notice the two words Christ? That's not his second name, that's a title. Jesus the Christ. He is the anointed one of God, he's the Messiah. Now when you think of what were the early Christians and what were the Jews hoping for in the way of a Messiah? Somebody to toss the Romans out. After all, they're an occupied people. Jesus is the Messiah, but in a unique way. He doesn't raise an army. He doesn't go ahead and throw the Romans out. Instead, what he does, he is the Messiah who brings us from death to life. He is the anointed one who by his resurrection changes the course of human history and transforms the world and each of us. When we say he's Lord, the only person that was called Lord was Yahweh. And here, the early Christians are saying Jesus is Lord, meaning he is divine in the same way that Yahweh is. Now, it took a while for us to uh, sort that out with theological language and what we call the Trinity. But the early Christians had this uh, belief, this deep abiding belief, that Jesus Christ, he is Son from all eternity, and he's Lord. He is God. 
And when they met him, they were meeting God. And then just a little bit on the letter to the Hebrews. In times past, God spoke in fragmentary and varied ways to our fathers through the prophets. In this, the final age, he spoke to us through his Son, whom he has made heir of all things and through whom he first created the universe. Then notice in the verse 3, this Son is the reflection of the Father's glory, the exact representation of the Father's being. So Jesus is not a lesser God. He is God. He is the exact representation of the Father's being. So when we pray in the Nicene Creed, God from God, light from light, these beliefs were already embedded in these early scriptures, which enshrined for us the apostolic preaching and teaching of the apostles, what is received from the Lord himself. So the resurrection is decisive. And what we mean by decisive is, when you read those passages on the resurrection, what is it that changes their faith? When they meet him. When they realize he is alive. That he's not dead. Now, right away, they're not exactly ready to lay their life down. What do they do? They hide out. In fact, in one of the passages at John, it says they go back to fishing. They weren't quite sure what to make of it. It is the Holy Spirit that when the Holy Spirit descends on them, makes all of this explicit and understandable. And that in the resurrection, they understand all that Jesus had preached to them. Now when we get to the creed, the formation of it, they're drawing on the preaching and teaching of the apostles, on sacred tradition, and they're also drawing on the scriptures. So the creeds, you've got to think of when the church began to baptize, what are you going to tell people? You need a way to explain to them what is it they're being incorporated into. So throughout Christianity, there were baptismal creeds. We're familiar, aren't we, with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and Pope Paul VI also wrote one. But in these very early centuries, we're now talking about the year 100, the church had been baptizing for 30 and 40 years, so it did formulate creeds. It drew from those texts in the old and new and said people need to know what and who they're being baptized into. The second point, the church was universal. Remember, it's going all over the world. Missionaries, how do they know it's the same faith? So the creeds allow for the church to be universal and for that faith to be the same, whether it's in Jerusalem, whether it's in Antioch, whether it's in Asia Minor. And then the third thing, the creeds also develop because of heresy, a distortion of the truth of the scriptures. And under number three, that's when the church began to use philosophical language. And sometimes that language is difficult uh, for us to penetrate, but it's there to preserve the truth of divine revelation and what's in sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Now here is just some of the heresies. You think it's tough in our world today? You know. If there's really a problem with some teaching in the church, I can send out an email, what they call a blast, huh? And can say to everybody, hey, be careful. There's people out there promoting what is something untrue. I also can send out a video. I can go ahead and communicate instantly. What were they able to do in the year 150? They had to depend on letters. And here are all these various kinds of heresies distorting the truth. I'm just going to just give you a sample of some of them, and you can see how confusing it must have been in trying to sort out the true faith. Gnosticism says that the material world is evil. 
The spiritual world is good. Now, if you hold that principle, then creation is a mistake. So, what happens then? Everything God created shouldn't be here. So those that were Gnostics said there's a secret knowing. And that secret knowing is not about Jesus Christ's passion, death, resurrection, but secret knowing how to get out of the material world. Then a, what follows on that is docetism. They were preaching that the sun only appeared to take a body. I mean, if there's dualism, if the material world is bad, why would there be an incarnation? So now you got them running around and teaching that. Then you got adoptionism that says, well, he's not really eternally son. Sometime along the way. Maybe his baptism. Maybe at the resurrection, he gets divine powers and becomes son of God. Well, you got all that now out there. You've got people preaching that. You've got people saying modalism. There's really no difference between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And those that held that, they were called Patripassians. As far as they're concerned, it's not really the Son on the cross. That's the Father. So you want to call it Father or Son or Holy Spirit? There is no distinction. Then Marcion, Marcionism, he says, you know, I'm going to rewrite the scriptures to accommodate as much of this as I can. So what does he do? He throws out anything with Jewish references gets rid of the Gospels except for Luke, and even says, I don't like the infancy narrative because that's suggesting that God took on human flesh, that the Son did. Well, you got all these things going on. You know you need a way to call us back to the apostolic faith. So we get to the Council of Nicaea, 325. This is the start of the creed that we pray every Sunday. And because of all of the heresies, it now is going to take the baptismal creeds in use and develop them. See, Arius was another one, and he really had a following. He's from Egypt, from Alexandria, in northern Africa. This is what he taught. The Father is eternal, but the Son has a beginning. The Son is created out of nothing. The Son is a lesser God. So what he does is he solves all the problems by having the Father as one God and the Son as a separate God, created by the Father and out of nothing. Well, you can imagine his bishop was not pleased with this. So Bishop Alexander calls him in and says, what is this all about? This goes against the scriptures. It goes against the letter to the Philippians, the letter to the, to the Hebrews, all of these letters. And he said, well, but this is the way we should understand the Son. He is before creation, but he's part of God's creative work. He is not God in the way that the Father is God. He's a lesser God. Well, then the Council of Nicaea, the, of all people to call it, Constantine calls all the bishops together and he says, we've got to end this because it's creating crisis and confusion. So the council then taught that the Son is eternal. The Son is truly God, not lesser. And then I mentioned they use philosophical term, that word homoousios meaning the Son is of the same being as the Father, the same substance. You notice how in our creed on Sunday, consubstantial with the Father? Some, I remember, I got a few letters here and there. Why? Because it's in the creed. And because if we don't say he's consubstantial, if we don't say he's of the same being as the Father, then is he a little lesser God? Is he, and then the question comes in, we can only be redeemed by God. So if he's not fully God, are we fully redeemed? So when the council then 
use these words, consubstantial, just in case in the creed we still weren't clear, it follows it up by saying he is what? God from God, light from light, true God from true God. That's all because of Arius. He was the person who wanted us to believe that the Son is created at the will of the Father, and he is not God eternally. So the Council of Nicaea corrected that. And then point number five. All of this is about our salvation. Are we really saved? Is Jesus Christ truly God? And is he truly man? Is he truly human? If he's not both of those, then can we say God has saved us? Well, because of all that confusion, the creed then was composed. Now, after every council, there's more confusion. I wish I could tell you that every time a bishop sends a letter out, everybody says, yay, thank you, bishop. Wow, we've been waiting for this. Homoousius does it for us. It didn't do it for them. In fact, there were those that wanted a different word or even wanted to remain Arians by saying that the Son is of a totally different nature than the Father, a totally different substance. But also, another group comes on the scene that says, you know, the Holy Spirit is just a figure of speech. You ever you heard where it's a nice way of saying, you know, that when we get together, Arnie's got a lot of spirit. But that doesn't mean a personal being. It just means it's a quality. So you had those that interpreted all of the scriptures about the Holy Spirit as not being personal and real and a third person in the Trinity, but simply an expression, a way to say that God has brought his energy into the world. So they were known as spirit fighters. It was worth three points on my exam the other day if they could come up with the real name, New Matamachians, you know? I said, that's three points. And I noticed on that page of the exam, uh, gremlins got in. And it came out that for each of these, you get three pints. <laughs> the O got left off. My students were very quick to point out to me, will that be at the ground round, or where are we going to meet? I said, just get it right on the test. So when they gather the Council of Constantinople, that's in, maybe you can see that to the far right-hand side, 381. They take the, the creed that ends rather abruptly the text ends, and in the Holy Spirit. And then they take that text, and then they deepen the teaching on the Holy Spirit, where they refer to the Holy Spirit as God. He is Lord, because only God can be adored and glorified. So that the Holy Spirit is not just an expression of energy, an expression of how the, we breathe, and can put a lot of ourselves into something. But that the Holy Spirit divinizes us is truly part of the Godhead. Now this is the creed, and I'd like to kind of point out to you, as you know from our last uh, revision of the creed, it used to be what? We believe in one God, and now it has gone back to I believe. That's because this was also used in baptismal instruction. And as you know, faith has always two interlocking parts. The first is that I believe, but then the other side is we're a community that believes. But I have to believe. In order for there to be a we, there has to be each of us in order for us to be able to be a community of belief. But it starts with each of us believing it. So the uh, last revision of our text emphasizes now the life of faith in each one of us. So it says, I believe in one God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Remember the Gnostics I pointed out? They didn't believe in the goodness of creation. So the creed says it all comes from God. God intended to create. It's not a mistake. And God has created both those things that we see as well as those things that are invisible, like angels, like other uh, aspects of our faith, those things that we don't see but are very much real. Then you notice uh, the second part of the creed. This is about the Son. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. So what they're pointing out there is that the Son does not have a beginning like Arius would like to have us believe. He's only begotten. He's begotten before all ages. Then again, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made. Because Arius said, no, the Son is created. Created out of nothing. So the creed points out that he is uh, not made, he's begotten. Then that word homoousios. And that's why you say, why do we have to say the word consubstantial? Because it's in the original creed. And it's a wonderful thing to be catechized on. And it says, through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. This is all about how we're saved. Came down from heaven. Now we get into what we call the neratio. The first part is all that God has done and in the sending of his son, but now the incarnation. And you notice we bow. And the feast of the Annunciation at Christmas were to genuflect. And came down from heaven, became man. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Now, isn't that wonderful? Pontius Pilate, this governor, procurator, who was as tough as nails, mean, he had crucifixions going on all the time. He would come to live in Jerusalem during the Jewish holidays, just in case the Jews were thinking of having an insurrection. And he'd bring all of his legions in because he would say, if you do, you're going to pay a price. And you notice he's in all of our passion narratives. The reason for it is that these are real events. This is not the way Star Wars opens. You know, far, far away, somewhere on a distant planet, long, long ago. This is not about how the donkey got long ears. And you make up a story about his ears being caught in the barnyard door, and he's pulling away. This is not about fiction. This is not about legend or mythology. It says he was suffered under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death against the Docetus. He was buried, rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. You even see some of that in St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Then he ascends into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. That in time, at the end of history, we once again, the living and the dead, the resurrection. Then the creed would have ended. Some of what was above has been added. But this is where the creed of Nicaea would have ended, and in the Holy Spirit. This is the big addition from the Council of Constantinople. They call him Lord. You only call God Lord. So just as they called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Lord, they call the Holy Spirit Lord, giver of life, proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped, he is adored and glorified. You can only adore God. You can't adore would be a lesser creature, or that's idolatry, spoken through the prophets. Then all of us, again, this year, to kind of brush off, not only the, to and deepen in us the content, but I believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church, those are the four marks of the church that distinguish us and that carry this continuity. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
So that uh, the creed ends reminding us that that journey does not end in this world, but that journey of faith takes us one day into the presence of God and to the resurrection of the dead. Now, this is a text that our Holy Father uh, has chosen to meditate on, and this is from Revelation. But let me show you, this is the adoration of the mystical lamb. This is by Jan van Eck. If any of you like uh, Renaissance uh, painting, and, I, and I, I happen to love that, this is from the book of Revelation. This is the New Jerusalem. This is what our Holy Father says we are called to one day in heaven. You can see at the very top there the Holy Spirit descending. That would be sent by the Father. You see the Lamb of God there on the uh, altar. You see the angels gathered around. And then the holy men and women of every age in the four corners of the painting. In other words, it's by holiness. And that is an, a desire for faith and the result of faith, that our lives then are brought into the mystery of the Eucharist. This text, after this I saw before me a huge crowd, which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne of the Lamb, dressed in long white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, salvation is from our God who was seated on the throne and from the Lamb. Think of this at Mass, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All the angels who were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell down before the throne to worship God. They said, Amen. Praise and glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor and power and might to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders asked me, who are these people all dressed in white? Where do they come from? I said to him, sir, you should know better than I. He then told me, these are the ones who have survived the great period of trial. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So there's the painting. Here's how our Holy Father puts it. By faith across the centuries, men and women of all ages, whose names are written in the book of life, Revelation 7, 9, and that's the text. Have confessed the beauty of following the Lord Jesus wherever they were called to bear witness to the fact that they were Christian, in the family, in the workplace, in public life, in the exercise of the charisms and ministries to which they were called. That's all of us. Every unique gift God has placed in us is for the common good and for the church. By faith, we too live. By the living recognition of the Lord Jesus present in our lives and in our history. That is how our Holy Father ends the uh, exhortation he gives us. And that's where I'm going to end today. I hope that the creed, that you'll use it to pray over it. To realize it is a product, not just of let's think things in our head and write down some wonderful propositions. They flow from the scriptures. They flow from God's incredible gifts to us in his entering into history and into Jesus Christ and to live that faith. And as our Holy Father says, enter the door and use the gifts and charisms in your life to build up the church and the creed which has defined who we are has kept us in that apostolic faith. I hope that in this year, you'll have some time to pray about it. But every Sunday, you don't just recite it. As someone said to me one time, you know when you really pray this, it's really countercultural, isn't it? This is really the opposite of what the world believes. Because if you were going to write your own creed, the way the world writes it, I believe in myself and in myself alone. And in the power I have, to make change. May God give me the money and resources for me to put my plan forward in the world. The creed is the opposite. May it be life-giving for all of us, 
May we use it to catechize, but all the more, be the way to eternal life. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What we'll do is this will be on the website if any of you want to download any of it. If you do, it's all yours. Take it and enjoy it. And have a good lunch. Um, all right, thank you.